Hello! So I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to do a normal review, just like always, of Mary Roach's Packing for Mars, but I also want to share some personal information. If you've been watching my channel for very long, you know that I have worked for two government labs in the duration of my career, and one of those was Johnson Space Center. So I want to share some of my personal sort of account and personal insights and and my experience working with NASA. I'm going to separate this into two parts. The first will be the review and the second will just be my blathering on about how awesome it was. And I want to share too just this was a big thing for my life. It impacted a lot of how I got the career that I did, how I transition to what I do now. It influenced where I went to grad school and that I went to grad school. So I want to share some of that with you and give you some of the same feelings that I had um, while working for NASA. So first off, the book. If you're familiar with Mary Roach, you already know her writing style is both factual and comedic in nature. So she talks about whatever given topic the book is about, in this case, the space programs. And it's tied not only for the US program, but she also tries to take in a multicultural approach, talking about the cosmonaut program as well as the Japanese program. And how the personality traits are different for the astronauts depending on their cultural background, which is expected. I think that she does an excellent job giving the astronauts Pers personhood. <laughs> she talks about them in a way as an individual and different character traits that they have individually, where most books, I think when you talk about an astronaut, you give them sort of, they are their profession. And yes, the profession has certain personality traits that are sort of associated with it, but I think she compares and contrasts the different programs well. She talks about um, the individuals, more thoroughly she discussed the engineering aspects and on that note if you have a <laughs> sensitive stomach I'm not sure if this book's really for you there's certain parts that you can skip without losing anything but I'd say the major focus of this book is bodily functions so if you are curious as to how a human survives everything that you do in a day <laughs> then this book is a great place to start she does a very fun, lighthearted <laughs> sort of take on a lot of these things. It's not so dry that it would be boring on, you know, how you poop in space. <laughs> yeah, just saying that. It's like, I never thought I'd do a video like this. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I think that aspect was really great. I do think that she tells instead of shows a lot, which I'm not sure if that's something I really want to be shown, but she mentions at one point all the engineering hurdles that you have to overcome with pooping in space and she talks about how a viewfinder came into being because people wanted a real toilet and she talks about the discussion with the astronauts or the discussion with the engineers and she talks about the feedback they received from the astronauts and then she talks about you know makes this random joke about oh they thought I was actually going to use it he 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 and they corrected me and then reiterated before they left that yeah don't actually pee in the toilet just so you know and then she talks about, and there's a viewfinder, but she doesn't actually talk about what it's like trying to use the bathroom when you have to use camera assistance to do so. So in that respect, I think it was, it did fall a little bit flatter for me. I think it also suffered just because of my background. This is what I do. I worked on some of the projects that she mentioned. So the bed rest study was actually ongoing. There's multiple groups there. And my group had its own bed rest study that was, it was going on while I was there. And so I'm already kind of familiar with a lot of the work that she talked about, so that wasn't that novel for me. There's also a blog about one of the participants' um, experience being a research subject for NASA for the bed rest study. I'll try to find it again. I found it while I was an intern. Uh, the second part is that she goes quite heavily into um, the early stages of the space program, which means there's a lot of human um, animal competition, which I thought was a little strange, but majority of the animal work can be quite nerve touching if you're sensitive to animal issues because they're launching animals into space with the expectation they're going to die and it's not just one. So you can skip that chapter 
if you need to and I don't think it would detract from the story. The overall theme is really good and it gives you a lot of just general background and information regarding the program in general. So I think overall I would recommend this book but if you do have some sensitivities I would not recommend you read those chapters and she has things pretty appropriately titled so I don't think you have to worry you'll know <laughs> when you get to the sections that you may not be okay with. And now for the fun part, <laughs> talking about telling and not showing, I'm going to just talk at you about how I thought working for NASA was. <laughs> Honestly, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. I had an amazing director. I was part of a small program, Building 37, if you're watching this, you know. <laughs> um, my group was great. My, my director was wonderful. He took a lot of time with me really trying to see that I was getting something out of this. It wasn't just free work for them. And he let me see a lot of behind the scenes things that I don't think a lot of the other interns got to because he has been with a company for a long time. Um, another thing that is not mentioned in the book that has been, it's been touched on in a few other books recently is the idea that someone is a contractor and therefore less than. The majority of employees at NASA are contract employees, so they do not formally work for NASA. Their badge, you know, says NASA, but so far as benefits are concerned, they're not. There's only, when I was there, the only civil servant, which is what you call the actual federal employees that work there, was my director. So only one person in my entire department was actually a, a federal employee. Everyone else was contracted through one of two major um, contracting firms. One was for scientific specialties that were not doctoral level and the other they called the PhD mill. So this was basically doctoral scientists are hired through this program and then contracted to NASA. So I want to get that out there. That's been at both government facilities that I've worked for. Almost everyone is contract and their actual employment and their check is signed by somebody else. So when someone says, oh, well, well, did they actually work for NASA or were they a contract? Yeah, more than likely they're a contract because everybody is. So don't let anybody tell you that someone's less than because they're a contract employee. Now on to some fun things. So I mentioned that the way that you taste changes with space flight. And because I worked for nutritional biochemistry, my program was pretty tightly um, tied to the food science department, the food scientists, and my director took me over for a tour and I got to meet a lot of the food scientists, which I thought was amazing. And they had pictures up of the of Tom Hanks and the Apollo 13 cast. And they recounted stories about what it was like to have famous people there, which I thought was hilarious because they're scientists at NASA. <laughs> But you know, whatever. And um, there's a reason that food tastes different when you fly. It's not just that airplane, airplane food is bad or that it's mass produced so that more people don't hate it, but it's that your perception, so your um, sensory perception of food changes when you fly because you're in a pressurized cabin and the humidity is often different. So from what I have found, um, I found a few different studies that relate to this topic with varied results, but they have mentioned that that's part of the reason that when we fly, things taste different. Um, one of the examples they mentioned was carbonation, so anyone who has ever ordered a Diet Coke while flying knows that. And the second was V8 juice or Bloody Marys. So the three components that they think change most, which this is still sort of controversial, so I don't think, I think that's why it was probably left out of the book, was acid, salt, and savory, which tomato juice has all three of those. So that's probably why it's more impacted than other things. Um, yeah, and I, I found that when I was tasting things for uh, the food science group, so they let me try a few different things. One of the things that I'm now allergic to, but I wasn't then, was shrimp. And she said, this is the most popular thing that the astronauts requested. Um, and it was Cajun shrimp. And it was sort of this red coated it looked like it had some sort of like spicy sauce but it wasn't wet coating the shrimp um like a cajun rub or something and it was sort of spicy but it wasn't that spicy to me and it was flavorful but it wasn't you know spectacular or anything and she said that yeah exactly it's not it's not fabulous but for some reason when they fly the astronauts loved it and that's one of the reasons that they recommend 
that astronauts not pick oh no i love that i am going to eat this meatloaf every single day no they're not going to because there's they're never gonna allow you to pick the same thing to eat every day because one you're probably going to get sick of it and two you don't know how you're going to react when you're in space to that particular food and if you brought only one entree item then <laughs> it could end very badly for you um some of the fun things that I got to do while there, I got to see the moon pool, so I got to just basically walk around it. I got to see a practice shuttle, so one of the training shuttles, which is on a platform and raises and lowers. My boss has been there for, I don't know, when I was there, he had been there for like 20 years or 15 years or something crazy. Um, so he kind of took me in and he was showing me and allowed me to actually crawl into the shuttle. And I'm fascinated, I'm wanting to touch everything because this is an actual mock-up that the astronauts train in. So I also couldn't be in there for very long. And while I was there, I noticed that there's the captain's chair because, you know, it's what they actually train in. So I walk up really sly and you're like, yeah, it's a chair. <laughs> Can I sit in the captain's chair? <laughs> and he laughed at me and told me no. <laughs> but as sort of a... Uh, consolation prize he did take me to mission control after that so I got to see the original mission control from like the Apollo 13 missions so the old version the new version that you see on television and then I got to go behind the scenes where shit actually happens and got to see all of the individual bays and there's some people that he knew there that let me put on headphones and listen to the International Space Station which I had always been fascinated with space. I mentioned before that physics was sort of my first scientific love, and I really, really wanted to be an astronaut as a child. I wanted nothing more than that, and then I found science, and I think I, I chose wisely, <laughs> but I, all of those feelings came back when I was sitting in that chair, and I'm gonna get all emotional. It's been years, but I, I'm still gonna get emotional. And anyone who has ever had a dream and got to see even a portion of that dream realized has felt this. But I sat in the chair and it's nothing like what you see on TV. It's not fancy at all. It's exactly what you would see like cubicle offices and they're not actual cubicles, but you know, like the, that gray color that they use that's, oh look, it's a color, it's not white <laughs> on, on the walls and everything and wasn't glamorous and or high tech, but sitting in that chair with the headphones on, hearing astronauts. I, <laughs> I got to see a little piece of that dream realized that day. And that's part of the reason that I started this channel is I realized that so many people think that to work in science, you have to be a teacher and you have to be a professor and you're gonna be working for a university. And one, most people don't understand what that actually is. And two, there are so many other things out there that you can do that are <laughs> that's just as cool and amazing as working for NASA. And I didn't have anyone to ask questions about those things. And I don't want anyone else to be in that situation. And I want you to have someone you can ask questions. And I don't pretend to know everything. And I don't pretend to have experience in everything. I was the summer intern at NASA. I did work for the other site, but that changed my life. And I was lucky that I knew someone that answered a question for me one day that allowed me to apply for that. And it changed my life. And I want the same thing for you. <laughs> Before I cry, I'm gonna, it's a book review. I don't know why this is so emotional for me, but I want this to be a discussion and I want people to have a place to go and ask questions about science and to do that through a love of books and demonstrations and science and learning and all the things. And I want you to be part of it and I'm happy to be here to be a part of it with you. And now, <laughs> cue the sappy music and I will finally let you go. Please, please, please ask me questions in the comments and send me messages if you want to see specific things. And if you want to know more about my current job, I remember that I am legally obligated that I can't share everything with that. But if you want to know what my job is like, what my day to day is and what being a scientist is, 
than I ask. I'll talk to you soon. I hope you liked this. Bye.